Hey everybody, Patrick Murphy, aka Prasicor here, back with some more stuff from Prehistoric Planet. Apple TV released some new information, enough for us to start to get a clearer idea of what we can expect when the series drops on May 23rd. Specifically, the Apple TV Plus website has been updated to include more specific information about each episode, including episode titles, runtimes, and even one image per episode. First, we'll go over the information, and then we'll talk about what this means, or could mean, for the show. Each episode comes with its own title, runtime, rating, accompanying picture, and a brief synopsis. Episode 1 is titled Coasts. It is 42 minutes long. It is rated TVG. The synopsis reads, A pregnant Tuarangisaurus is in distress, and her young calf can sense it as she travels waters that are home to the ocean's deadliest predators. It is accompanied by this picture of the titular Tuarangisaurus, the mother curling her neck back around to support this young baby, which is suspended in a reclining position. Episode 2 is titled Deserts. It is 40 minutes long. It is rated TVG. The synopsis reads, Above the deserts of North Africa, aerial combat ensues as male barbarodactylists fight for the attention of females below. It is accompanied by a picture of two of the females in question, looking straight up at the sky, where we can see the blurry silhouettes of males flying around them. They appear to be standing on a high, rocky outcrop or plateau, overlooking the desert. Episode 3 is titled, Freshwater. It is the shortest episode at 39 minutes long. It is also the only episode to be rated TVPG. The synopsis reads, With its feathered body and duck bill, the eight-ton Dinochirus wanders through an Asian wetland in search of relief from pesky biting flies. It is accompanied by an image of Dinochirus, very similar to what we saw in the trailer, facing the camera at a slight angle, its mouth filled with pond weeds. Episode 4 is titled Ice Worlds. It is 41 minutes long. It is rated TVG. The synopsis reads, Within the snow-covered forest, a tense standoff develops between ancient rivals, Pachyrhinosaurus and Nanooksaurus. Like the previous image, this one looks similar to one seen in the trailer, a group of Pachyrhinosaurus bunched together, staring down a Nanooksaurus. Episode 5 is titled Forests. It is 41 minutes long. It is rated TVG. The synopsis reads, A journey through an underground cave in North America turns perilous when a young triceratops is separated from its mother. Another image stray out of the trailer. The young triceratops rounds the corner of a fallen log with an adult visible behind it. It may not seem like much at first glance. Uh, mostly because there isn't. But there's still more to work with here than you might think. As far as general observations go, it looks like I was right in my initial guess that the episodes would be centered around different biomes, rather than focusing on single locations, as per the Planet Earth model. The episode descriptions only mention one location and only one or two animals, but I think it's safe to say that each episode will contain more, considering there are many places and animals that aren't accounted for. 40 minutes is a nice runtime, long enough to include significant content, but not long enough to overstay its welcome. Five episodes at around 40 minutes each gives us a total of 200 minutes, or 3 hours and 20 minutes. Now let's take a closer look at each episode individually. I gave three possible identifications for the long-necked elasmosaur from the trailer, and all three were wrong. It is none other than Tuarangisaurus from New Zealand, giving us a new confirmed location for a total of 12. These are undoubtedly the same mother and offspring from the trailer, with the baby even having the same stark white color scheme. Though some have suggested that this is some form of albinism, this is very unlikely. A more probable option is that the babies are simply a different color than the adults. Belugas do the inverse, where they start out purplish or gray, and then become white as they age. The posture of the baby is cute, though also a bit of a head-scratcher. What's it doing? It seems an unlikely birthing posture, given that plesiosaurs would have been born tail first to avoid drowning. Is it playing? Sleeping? Guess we'll just have to wait to find out. The picture does seem to be a bit of a spoiler, though. The synopsis says that the female is pregnant, but here she is, apparently with a calf, assuming it's the same one, of course. Will the story cover her struggle to survive while pregnant, similar to the Walking with Beasts episode Whale Killer? 
Or will she give birth at some point during the episode and then struggle to protect the baby afterwards? And what about the idea that her unborn calf can sense its mother's distress? Is she pregnant with another baby as well as being accompanied by a live calf? It's a very cryptic statement. Less cryptic is the fact that the mother will be moving through waters filled with, quote, the ocean's deadliest predators, unquote. As far as the Maastrichtian is concerned, that usually means mosasaurs. Giant mosasaurs are known from the same rocks as Tuarangisaurus, from the Tahora Formation, namely Moanosaurus. However, Taniwasaurus is also known from latest Cretaceous New Zealand, and it's known from better material, so it would be a valid choice as well. However, we shouldn't automatically jump to the conclusion that the giant mosasaurs we saw from the trailer are the same ones that the Tuarangisaurus will be trying to avoid. There are still those rumors about a confrontation between a T-Rex and a mosasaur to consider, so these two could be different mosasaurs altogether. It would hardly be surprising for there to be more than one giant mosasaur in the series. Moving on to episode 2, one of my tentative identifications for the Nyctosaurine turned out to be correct. This is Barbarodactylus, and is the same pterosaur from this shot in the trailer, as confirmed by the shape of the crests. We are clearly seeing some strong sexual dimorphism here, unsurprising given that, of all the animals in the fossil record, pterosaurs are some of the animals with the most evidence of this kind of differentiation between the males and females, though it's still far from a certainty. The premise of the segment is pretty straightforward, though it will be interesting to see how exactly the males compete for females. The synopsis describes, quote, aerial combat, unquote, which could look pretty cool, maybe something like what sea eagles do today. The posture of the supposed females is also worth mentioning. They could just be looking up at the battling males, but it also looks a bit like the way that albatross pairs communicate. Could just be a coincidence, but I'm going to file that one away in the back for later. Episode 3 doesn't reveal a whole lot on the surface. What most sticks out to me is that the premise of the segment is comical. You could even premise a Looney Tunes short on something like this, which is in keeping with the goofy appearance of the animal. One possibility is that each episode will have a primary segment, one that eats up more of the runtime than the others, and a few secondary segments that don't go on for very long. If so, then this one feels more appropriate for a secondary segment. I just can't imagine this going on for very long. I certainly hope it won't. There's nothing quite as annoying as a joke that goes on for too long. As noted before, one of the more remarkable things about this episode is that it's rated TVPG. According to the Rating Systems Wiki, which I am just now learning is apparently a thing, the United States TV Parental Guidelines assigns a rating of TVPG for content that contains mildly suggestive dialogue, infrequent coarse language, mild sexual content, and or mild violence. I think we can safely rule out suggestive dialogue and coarse language, so that just leaves mild sexual content and mild violence. Though the former is a possibility, I think the latter is more likely for a program like this. It certainly makes you wonder what's more violent about this episode compared to the others. The image for episode 4 actually reveals some interesting details that we couldn't see in the trailer. The colors of both animals are much easier to make out. The Pachyrhinosaurus appear to be deep forest green, with bright yellow blotches on their nasal bosses. While the yellow is visible in this image from the trailer, here they appear more brown than green. Is this sexual dimorphism? Individual variation? Seasonal variation? Or does it have more to do with color grading and I'm reading too much into it? That's always possible. The colors of the Nanooksaurus are also easier to make out. The body is dark grayish brown, while the snout has an orange hue. Looking more closely, we see that the Pachyrhinosaurus have bar pupils. As a general rule, bar pupils are associated with grazing animals that live in open environments as a way for them to spot possible threats. That would be in keeping with what we see of their habitat, though again, these are general rules, not hard laws. Unlike the previous episode synopsis, this one feels like it's more in keeping with a primary segment than a secondary one. I have to admit to not being a huge fan of the framing of the conflict as that between, quote, ancient rivals, unquote. It's not as if the conflict is personal, after all. This is an annoying tendency of nature programs that feel the need to inject drama into their stories, rather than allowing the drama to unfold organically. More of a pet peeve than a major deficiency, though. Lastly, we come to episode 5. This close-up look at the young Triceratops allows for an interesting contrast. Despite being fairly closely related to Pachyrhinosaurus, 
the Triceratops have round pupils instead of bar-shaped. Perhaps this is a reflection of their forest environment, and is a very nice touch. One of my favorite things about how Prehistoric Planet handles its dinosaurs is that it avoids painting them with broad brushes. Even closely related species can differ, usually as a result of their different habitats and ecological niches. The cold-adapted Pachyrhinosaurus have insulating quills and bar pupils, while the Triceratops of the subtropical forests lack any insulating integumentary structures and have round pupils. This attention to detail and complexity really helps the animals to feel as real as possible. The synopsis is also interesting compared to the others. Unlike the comical Dinochirus, or the life-and-death struggle of the ice world, this one has more of an adventurous feel. Indeed, it almost reminds me of the land before time, albeit on an infinitely smaller scale. If Prehistoric Planet is to be successful, it has to make sure that it offers that most delectable spice of life. Variety. Because the program focuses on animals, there are limits to the complexity of their emotions and the depth of their stories. To overcome that limitation, the episodes will have to squeeze every ounce of potential they can out of their premise. This means varying the stories and characters as much as possible. If the episodes show nothing but the same tired behaviors of hunting, migrating, competing for mates, etc., then the audience will have little reason to come back the next night, no matter how spectacular they make the segments. Now that we've looked at each episode, what I want to do now is see if we can place each shot from the trailer into each episode. I'm going to try to not overthink this and just focus on the environments that we see. Note that I will be using my tentative identifications from my first trailer analysis video in order to make these predictions. First two shots are of a beach, coasts. Shot of a Lasmosaurus at the surface, coasts. Chianjusaurus in the forest, forest. Hatsugotrix on a beach, coasts. Dromaeosaur in the desert, deserts. T Rex swimming in coastal waters, coasts. Zelmoxes in a forest, forests. Struthiosaurus in a forest, forests. Tarbosaurus and a dromaeosaur in the desert, deserts. The shot of the pterosaurs on the cliffs isn't as clear. It doesn't fit neatly into any one of the five episode categories. Due to the presence of a freshwater river, waterfall, and lake, I'm guessing this is most likely fresh water. Dinochirus in the wetlands, fresh water. Magyarosaurus on the beach, coasts. As dark it's scavenging, deserts. Migrating a Lorotitan, deserts. Nanoxaurus hunting Pachyrhinosaurus, ice worlds. Dreadnought is fighting, deserts. Edmontosaurus in the snow, ice worlds. Tuarangisaurus swimming, coasts. Morzalmoxes, forests. T-Rex nuzzling. Now here's where things get interesting. We saw T-Rex earlier, and it seemed pretty obvious that that was a coastline. But this is definitely more in keeping with a forest. At the end of the trailer, we see T-Rex for a third time, with one standing over a dead Triceratops. We know for a fact that Triceratops features in the Forests episode, so that would strongly suggest that T-Rex appears in both episodes. There is a certain amount of sense in that, the series would open and close on everyone's favorite dinosaur. Looking elsewhere in the trailer, we see similar examples. Animals that I've tentatively assigned to Hattig Island show up in both the Coasts episode and the Forests episode. The Nemat formation pops up in the Deserts and Freshwater episodes. It's important to keep this in mind as we try to determine how many segments each episode will have. Going back to the trailer, we have Tuarangisaurus pursuing prey, coasts. Carnotaurus displaying, forests. Fighting mosasaurs, coasts. Dromaeosaurs over a waterfall, deserts. Beelzebufo ambush, freshwater. Valor trapped in a fire, forests. More Changesaurus hunting, forests. Triceratops herd, forests. Pachyrhinosaurus headbutting, ice worlds. Barbrodactylus snatching prey, deserts. Scurrying alvarosaurs, deserts. T Rex bellowing, forests. As I said, I tried not to overthink it. The Barbrodactylus is seen flying over the waves of a beach, but we know that it features in the desert episode, and deserts can be by the ocean. Same with the Dromaeosaurs overlooking the waterfall. That could be fresh water, but given we saw one in the desert earlier, that seems more likely. Though it's also worth noting that any of these could show up in multiple episodes, thereby throwing me off. With that in mind, here's the breakdown. Episode 1, 
Coasts includes Segment 1, Tuarangisaurus Mother Segment 2, T-Rex Father Segment 3, Hattig Island, Megarosaurus, and Hatsigopteryx The fighting mosasaurs could be in any one of these segments, or they could be in their own. Episode 2, Deserts Segment 1, Tarbosaurus and Dromaeosaurs Segment 2, Alvarosaurs Though both these segments take place in the Nemet Formation, there are visual differences that make me think they will be treated as different segments. Segment 3, Barbardactylus mating. Segment 4, Allura Titan herds. Segment 5, Dreadnoughtus fighting. Episode 3, Fresh Water. Segment 1, Small Pterosaurs on the Cliffs. Segment 2, Dinochirus in the Wetlands. Segment 3, Beelzebufo ambush. Episode 4, Segment 1. Pachyrhinosaurus and Nanuxaurus. Segment 2. Edmontosaurus. Again, there are some visual differences that suggest this will be treated as another segment, even though both segments take place in the Prince Creek region. Indeed, given the small number of Maastrichtian ice worlds, this may be a necessity. Episode 5. Forests. Segment 1. Thalmoxes, Struthiosaurus, Valor. Segment 2. Hunting Changusaurus. Segment 3. Carnotaurus displaying. Segment 4. Triceratops and T-Rex. In summation, Episode 1 has three segments. Episode 2 has five segments. Episode 3 has three segments. Episode 4 has two segments. Episode 5 has four segments. It's tempting to think that since Episode 2 has five segments, that they all do, but that's not a given. As stated previously, there probably aren't five ice worlds to fill out Episode 4. However, it is likely that there are still segments that haven't been revealed. Let's see if we can figure out what they might be. This is based more on gut feelings than anything else, but I think we can expect a minimum of three segments per episode, with some having more based on how much material there is to cover. We also need to remember that the segments may not be perfectly segregated, and the segments may be interspersed throughout each episode. Either way, if we assume three segments per episode, that gives us an average of 13.3 minutes per segment, Four segments gives us 10 minutes per segment, and five gives us eight minutes per segment, though this is assuming that each segment will get the same amount of time, which they probably won't, especially if we go with the idea of primary versus secondary segments. This is all a lot to say that we still don't know exactly how the episodes will be structured, but these are the possibilities. What about the missing segments? Are there any that we can determine based on the available evidence? Well, no but it's still fun to think about, right? We still have reason to believe that the Lametta formation from India will be in the show. Some parts of the Lametta are interpreted as palustrine, meaning they were deposited in wetlands. This makes me think that if Lametta does show up, it will most likely be in episode 3, bringing the total number of segments up to 4. Then there's episode 4, which only has two segments, both of which are in the same location. What's our best bet for a third segment? Well, if the focus is ice worlds, then one place to look is the far south. Are there any Maastrichtian rocks known from Antarctica? There are, but there's not a ton of information on them out there, certainly not much that's easily accessible. There's the Snow Hill Island Formation, which is usually interpreted as Campanian, but has also occasionally been interpreted as early Maastrichtian. If so, then we might expect a number of small Elasmarian ornithopods, closely related to walking with dinosaurs Lielinosaura, the Paravian theropod Imperobator, or the fragmentary Ankylosaur Antarctopelta. Marine fossils like Elasmosaurs and Ammonites are also known from Snow Hill Island, so they might choose to focus on the oceans, which would make sense given that's what many documentaries on the poles do today. This makes Snow Hill the most obvious choice, but the show could always throw us a curveball. Piece by piece, the show is coming together and continues to impress and excite. The only thing that I would consider disappointing is the rating of each. I was hoping for something a little more mature. I certainly wouldn't want the focus of the series to be violence, but violence, truly terrible violence, is a part of the story of life. An important part, the impact of which is all the more powerful when juxtaposed by the relative peace of the other parts. Violence is most powerful when it punctuates the unsuspecting calm. Silence sundered by screams, the fumbling of frantic feet, vivid red 
splattered on forest green, followed by the tearing of flesh, the breaking of bone. But this too passes, calm is restored again, life carrying on as it always does, a precious, fragile piece, destined to once more be punctured by the sudden eruption of violence. Then again, we all know kids love dinosaurs, and it makes sense that they'd want to attract as large an audience as possible, so the rating makes sense. For reference, TVPG is the average rating for episodes of Doctor Who, or Star Trek The Next Generation, so that's the most we can expect, and only from episode 3. Assuming episode 3 contains the segment with Beelzebufo, then the sight of it catching the fleeing dinosaur could very well be the violence in question. Nonetheless, it's still very apparent that there is a lot more to come that we still don't know, and that little we have seen still looks fantastic. As the 23rd grows ever closer, the anticipation becomes almost unbearable. Once again, I'd like to thank my friend Sophie for helping me with my speculations. Thank you for watching. There may be more Prehistoric Planet videos in the future, though there's not much time between now and the show's premiere, so we'll see. Either way, remember to tune in on May 23rd on Apple TV+.